Eh, Timothy Sturgeon es investigador senior en el Centro de Transformaciones Industrial del Instituto Tecnológico de Massachusetts. Su investigación está enfocada al proceso global de integración con énfasis en las prácticas de deslocalización y tercialización en las industrias de electrónica, automotriz y de servicios industriales. Su trabajo explora las implicaciones para el empleo, desarrollo industrial, aprendizaje tecnológico y política de profundización de los vínculos comerciales entre las economías industrializadas y en desarrollo. Tim ha hecho contribuciones significativas a la teoría de la cadena del valor global, GBC, y está trabajando para mejorar las métricas y los métodos disponibles para la investigación de la globalización. Colabora activamente con los responsables de la formulación de políticas de las agencias internacionales de desarrollo, los países industrializados y los países en desarrollo en respuestas de políticas efectivas y viables a la interpretación, integración global. Tim es coeditor junto con Momoko Kawakami de Aprendizaje Local en Cadenas de Valor Mundiales, Experiencias de Asia Oriental, publicado por Palgrave Macmillan y ha publicado su investigación en revistas arbitradas internacionales, incluidos estudios en desarrollo internacional comparativo, cambio industrial y corporativo, revisión de economía política internacional, revista de estudios de Asia Oriental y revista de geografía económica. Nuestro comentarista, que es Luis Fonserrada, aún no ha llegado, pero vamos a empezar en honor a los que llegamos. Adelante. Thanks, Isidro. Um, I'd like to thank, before I start, uh, Ricardo and Miriam for this excellent organization of this uh, really interesting conference. It's fun to be in, in, uh, back in Mexico again. Um, I'm going to start off with, as a lot of people have done in this conference, to really try to define what it is we're talking about. And I think that's significant, that we're at this stage of taxonomy where we're just trying to get the right words and identify the right phenomenon to describe something new. So this happens again and again, and um, it can actually take a long time to really agree on, even on, on the language of something new. And it's a little disconcerting uh, when the events are moving so quickly and we're still back here trying to figure it out what to even call things. But you know, there's nothing to do about it. That's where, we are, <laughs> where we're at. Um, so I will um, try to, to do some of that, that my own journey into defining uh, the digital economy is captured in the paper that is online. Um, I was, uh, the story is I was hired uh, by UNCTAD to make contributions to this year's um, uh, information uh, economy report and talk about the digital economy, but I had to go back and figure out, well, what is the digital economy? So, you know, eight months later, the 30, 38 pages long, um, I think I sort of figured out what I think and I've learned a lot along the way. So, uh, okay, so uh, I'm going to talk about you know, what it is, what's really new about it, because the reason I always put the um, new in quotes, although I forgot to put the second quote around new up there, so. <laughs> Always something. Um, but anyway, the, the reason I, I put quotes around the word new is because many of the trends um, and technologies and industry uh, features that, that we think about when we think about the digital economy have been underway for a very, very long time. So we really have to ask ourselves, is, is this a continuation or is there something really new? Um, so anyway, then I, I, I will touch on some, a few of the key characteristics that I focus on. We've already had key characteristics from other uh, speakers um, that are different than mine, and that's, again, this taxonomy process of trying to figure out what it is we're, we're talking about. And then I'll focus on this globalization question, uh, global value chains, the location of both production and innovation, uh, and then I'll move into the measurement um, discussion. How, how can some of these things be measured? Something else I think we're um, pretty early on. I mean, OECD, I think, has uh, led the way in, in, in asking these questions. Um, but when I see the measurements, the indicators that are out there now, for example, the UNCTAD report that did come out, the um, Information Economy Report, on the, this one was on the digital economy. The indicators they give are interesting, 
but they're not economic statistics. You know, you can't really build a policy around, um, wow, it's neat that, you know, there's so many mobile phones in China, or that the web traffic is focused on these types of, uh, people looking at these types of web websites. So there is data out there, but it's not necessarily economic data. So what, I ha what I've kind of boiled out, and I think is not super unusual, is you know, five pieces, um, advanced manufacturing. So that's things like embedded sensors, uh, robotics, uh, factory automation, um, and uh, <clears throat> I, I just mentioned that some of these machines are very cheap. So what you see is industrial systems and production equipment uh, moving from only you know, multi-million dollar investments to something that you can buy and put on your desktop. So this is something like consumer drones, uh, 3D printers that, that are for consumers. And, you know, you can run ahead and say, well, everybody's going to make everything they need in their basement. And that's ridiculous. But th there is, I think it is significant that you have this, the technology is opening up possibilities for, um, for the average person or the prosumer, uh, the, the consumer that has a, wants to pay a little bit more than for a toy. So there's robot arms and drones that are toys. But you can spend $1,000 and get a robot arm um, or a drone that can provide you with incredible amount of functionality. So that's that prosumer space. I just think it's worth mentioning. Um, the, I think one of the, the things that's really changed is just data flowing from everywhere. So data is flowing from these factories, but data is flowing from us. Every time we use you know, our, our, our click trail and you know, every time we use our phone, um, GPS, et cetera. So there's data that is kind of flowing um, uh, into the, um, the cloud, which is the next kind of piece of it, is, a, is, a, is this kind of way of, of storing a, of information and data remotely. Um, so, the, the, so that's the kind of pattern where the data is produced, stored in the cloud, where it can be analyzed through uh, big data analytics, new uh, data science tools to look at really large um, bundles of, of information. So these huge sample sizes can, you know, provide insights that really weren't there before because there's just so much data. Um, and you also have high fault tolerance because, because you have so much data um, in these large sample sizes. I think what was getting a lot of the buzz, and I just got back from a, uh, a conference at MIT on the future of work, um, and AI. So artificial intelligence is creating a lot of excitement. Um, machine learning, um, machine decision making, self maintenance, um, and replication of the machines themselves. Uh, and this is something that is, you know, very, very has a lot of, um, you know, feels like science fiction, but uh, is really uh, coming into 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 broader use. And I think that we all experience AI every day when we, you know, call, uh, we go to a call center and we have an automated prompt, which actually drives you absolutely crazy. The idea of, you know, that usually doesn't work very well. Um, the idea of your refrigerator, I'm sorry, telling you that, you know, you need uh, some milk. <laughs> and then, you know, I, the idea of they know that you're buying milk, so then they serve up the ad for the milk that, you know, right at the moment, that's really what that's about. It's not about get, getting you milk. It's about serving up that ad just at the right moment. Is it, that would be enough for me to, you know, take a hammer to my refrigerator. <laughs> I wouldn't like that. Um, so a lot of these, I think, are applications um, or technologies in search of an application. Um, and, you know, the consumer backlash is of the creepiness of the invasive um, uh, observation and monitoring of everything that you do. Um, you know, I think we're, we'll see some type of adjustment to that. But in, in industry, in behind the scenes, in things that most of us don't see, the application of, uh, of artificial intelligence is running ahead, and all of these technologies actually are running ahead much, much faster. So as, as, as pervasive of, as all of this seems in our daily life with social media, et cetera, in the industrial system, um, that's really where the excitement is, and the money is already being made. <clears throat> And, and we can also extend it to lots of other stuff. Um, gene editing, bioengineering, nanotechnology, advanced materials. This is very kind of data-driven um, uh, processes. And then we see every day, I mean, I opened up my news feed this morning um, to see a, a, a news story about a 
a, a, a technology where you, you breathe into a, a tube and it, it can detect 27 different types of diseases. And you say, well, that does, what does that have to do with information technology or big data or anything like that? But it's really the software that's, that's um, important in, in that. And then they're talking about embedding that in your phone. So then you, can, you have your smartphone, well, it's a sniff phone, so it'll, it'll tell you if you're, it'll monitor your health and that type of thing. So it all is part of this, uh, what, I guess the point is that, that there's, the technology is moving ahead in, in many fronts, use, based in part on, uh, on, on these technologies here, that I list here, um, and that it's just extremely pervasive. So what's new? You know, this idea that, um, you know, with, through Moore's Law, um, the increasing uh, power of information technology is, is an old, old idea. Um, and so Moore's Law is continuing to push forward, although there's some debate about that. But it, the, the idea of the cloud has, seems to be altering computer architecture back to this centralized computing platform. So our, it used to be that we had dumb terminals in the mainframe. And then the PC started doing all the processing and storing all of our data. And now we're offloading more and more of that to, into the cloud. Uh, so it's starting to resemble that, that, that um, not the client server, but the uh, terminal uh, centralized. So, um, so that pushes you know, down the cost, up the speed. We uh, have platforms and data pooling. So this cost and speed part um, were, is old news. So this has been going on for a long time. But I think that you get these tipping points, particularly in things, for example, in graphics processing units, the GPUs, the ability to look at, um, at, at the geometry of, well, faces or <coughs> other types of, of visual imagery, and then do calculations um, uh, is, is the deepest part of AI. Is, that's a, a main kind of technique um, uh, of AI is, is, is facial recognition. So the GPUs have gotten so powerful that they can look at millions of faces in a very short period of time instead of tens of faces. So when you have that sample size go up, the decision making is much, much uh, better. Um, but still not new, you know, the, 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 in terms of driving the, uh, the, the capabilities forward. But this, this idea of platforms that we've been talking about um, and data pooling in the cloud is really a, a new feature. When we had centralized computing before, it was really owned by the company that had the mainframe computer. Now we have shared resources, shared infrastructure, infrastructure for hire, infrastructure that's kind of maintained offline um, uh, by, other or by the organization that's providing you the service. So you have this kind of value, this value chain, and a global value chain, really, of, of products and services that are making up the, the computing infrastructure, you know, connect, all connected through the internet. So that's uh, essentially new. Um, opening up you know, vast new areas for innovation, but also new areas for social control, uh, monitoring of your life and disruption. So there's, you know, like anything, there's a positive and negative side to it. And I think a lot of our discussions about the digital economy um, kind of center on these challenges, opportunities, um, you know, risks and, and, and possibilities that are coming out of it. So. We really don't know where it's headed, but we know it's a big deal. So a mega trend um, intersects with nearly everything, and the policy in implications are just huge. And I think policymakers are behind, as usual. <coughs> but really, in the end, you know, is, it, is it a kind of a panacea that's going to solve all of our problems, or a crisis? But it's really about the speed um, of change. Is it, if it's a slow drip of change, um, we can adjust. If not, um, there'll be more disruption. But the thing is, is, th is that all possibilities are on the table right now. We don't know where this is headed. And the, I, the fact that we're all here talking about this in this conference and in dozens and dozens of conferences uh, and discussions around the world right now, before anything's really become clear, uh, I think really is a um, kind of unique in, in we're not reacting, we're being a little bit proactive. So I think that, that that's actually a good thing because uh, it'll be important for policymakers and, and the data community to try to get out ahead of this a little bit. Okay, so the policy questions are vast. These are just a few of them. Who's gonna build the systems? Uh, where are they gonna emerge? Because even with tech, uh, information technology so far, 
There's been a lot of uneven development, so there's places that are connected, disconnected, um, and, the, and, it, and the, the consequences of that will only increase. Um, what about labor and skills? We've talked about that. Um, and what we haven't talked about, and what I'm going to try to bring in next, is the geography of the geography of, of the innovation and the production part. So these discussions tend to be um, discussed in the abstract in terms of geography. The digital economy is just out there, and there's jobs that are just out there. They're not connected to any jurisdiction or, or in the discussion or geography. And, that, and, and the world works in terms of, um, you know, very much in terms of uh, various geographies and how they relate to each other and how, how um, you know, one geography can uh, dominate another or, uh, or link in or upgrade or create opportunities for others. Um, so, um, so we don't really know how the balance of power is going to shift in the, in the global economy because of the NDE, uh, but that's something that's, that's important and we don't really know, um, again, where we're headed in terms of uh, the kind of social outcomes. So the key characteristics that I've focused on all have to do with managing complexity. You have uh, a system that has become incredibly complex. No uh, individual, uh, let alone, uh, or company, um, or country can really um, create or understand or manage all of the parts of the system. So you have to break it down and you have to make the different parts interoperable. So there's different ways to do that. The, the idea of a platform uh, is, is uh, where you have these intermediaries, but you also have standard ways of, of, of linking uh, different products and activities together. Um, companies have turned in a really dramatic way towards open innovation, uh, basically, you know, in, in various ways, and, and, and creating standards to make this kind of thing happen. And then there's the idea of modularity uh, that underpins all of this, where you have um, kind of modular uh, parts of the system but also companies that can connect and disconnect to other companies in a modular way. And that has um, uh, strong implications for, glo for um, globalization, um, as I'll, I'll go into. So um, this is how I think of platforms in this big ecosystem, is not as this platform and that platform, but as a series of nested platforms. So you can see these, the, the platforms are based on technology platforms, so particular you know, chipsets and uh, other uh, uh, programming languages and other um, technological inputs um, that, that underpin the creation of these core platforms. So this would be like a Facebook or a Google. Um, but then on top of that, you know, we focus a lot on these core platforms. We have higher level platforms like Uber that kind of run um, uh, on the smartphone, over the internet, and really couldn't exist without all of that other, those other platforms underneath it. And then we have the end users um, who uh, you know, are at the, at, the, at the kind of receiving end of all of that. So it's one way to kind of reconcile the idea of the value chain with the platform, is to think about platform layering. So just to be a little less abstract, um, here's an example from the from mobile, phone, uh, um, mobile phone ecosystem where you have the general interconnect standards that are actually a, a de jure process of negotiation to work out the, what the criteria are for these general interconnect standards like 2G, 3G, 4G, 5G. Then um, uh, companies um, implement those, those standards in various ways. Um, and, and they have been in the past um, uh, uh, basically associated with specific geographies. But now with LTE, these are basically global interconnect standards and those become less and less of a thing to negotiate over <laughs> and they become less and less, taking less of the processing power of the, of the chipset and they basically become irrelevant. I mean, we have a paper about how the Chinese government tried to develop a Chinese interconnect standard to control the, the industry in their country, but quickly became irrelevant because it went so far down this, the technology stack that it just didn't control anything anymore. <laughs> and it moved up to things like mobile apps um, up at the top, things like WeChat, um, WhatsApp. So anyway, chipsets, handsets, you get the idea, operating systems. 
So this is a series of platforms. None of the top, uh, higher level platforms could really operate without the lower, no, lower ones. Okay. So these are the two-sided platforms. So each of the um, uh, platform layers are <clears throat> and operate as two-sided markets with um, third parties providing inputs <coughs> to the platform and then end users one layer up. <coughs> What's interesting about this to me, you can go back here, is, is that you know, each of these um, uh, uh, layers uh, is the digital economy is cre creating d uh, disruption and opportunity and risks and all of, this, all of these, these issues at each of these layers. So this is one reason that the digital economy, the changes are so pervasive, in, in, and not even on the social side, but on the, on, the, on the industry side, is that at each layer you have third party, uh, third party vendors, um, complementers to the platform, providing services for things like ARM or Qualcomm or Android. Uh, thousands of small companies providing uh, uh, services that, that go into these platforms uh, and in their different iterations. Um, and then you have all of the, um, the you know, the, 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 the folks uh, uh, working in the, in the, on the platform itself and then working through the platform to do things. So in the end, uh, you know, this is a very large kind of high level look at what I'm talking about. If you start at the top with the factory and user data, you have a series of platforms underneath that because there's factory automation platforms, right? There's platforms that manage your sensor data. There's, you know, platforms all the way down there that um, out, of, out of that, um, you know, the data flows into the cloud storage. Again, a series of platforms. There's big, uh, then where the data can be analyzed. And again, a series of platforms for uh, big data an analysis that you can apply to, to various piles of data, AI platforms, and then, you know, this, I, this science fiction idea that through AI, the system can look at all this whole sequence of events and uh, automatically um, uh, upgrade the system without human intervention. So that can happen, I think, in a small scale, but it can also eventually happen in a large scale, and that's when we get into very science fiction ideas of singularity, et cetera. So, um, open standards, and I won't walk through all of this, but there's, from examples, um, open innovation um, companies are, uh, uh, have created annotated um, image databases to do AI testing, and that's just very laborious. So they basically outsource that and share that, those, data, those data sets. Um, so there's, Microsoft has led the common objects in context data set. So you can see, you can read about that if you're interested. Um, and there's other training data sets. Um, here's another example on the hardware side where big companies like Facebook decided that the, the architecture of their data centers was not a core competence. And they just basically turned over their, the design of their data centers into the public domain uh, through this OpenStack um, consortium. So companies, many other companies got in uh, behind that, Google finally got in uh, two, last year in 2016. And what's interesting about that is it's opened up opportunities for um, um, the vendors of kind of, 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 of hardware and software for data centers uh, for new actors to come in because they don't have to build the whole quirky architecture to Hewlett Packard standard or some other company standard. They use this generic standard. So we see companies like from Taiwan. Um, such as Quanta and uh, Foxconn um, getting into that market. But it's not free innovation. Um, as von Hippel would say, it's, it's open innovation. It's a piece of the, of the architecture. It's not, the, uh, it's not entirely free. Okay, so in terms of globalization, the way that, that this has been um, talked about before is that you go from this integral process of, of developing products where you sit around the, the conference table and in the lab and, um, and, and discuss how to do things to formalizing the handoff of information from one group inside the firm to the next. So that's that second arrow. At some point, those formalized linkages <coughs> become standardized and you can bring your suppliers in to, uh, to hand off the information in that kind of uh, modular way. And so you, have, you can move into outsourcing. When you move into outsourcing, 
then there's no reason that you can't outsource across borders. So then you move into these global value chains uh, where these modular linkages are, um, are uh, enable um, companies to send extremely complex information and, re and requirements across vast distances instead of having to be in the same building or even in the same city or in the same country. Um, so this is how we've, we've conceptualized the formation of global value chains in technology intensive industries. So all I'll say is that with the digital economy, with platforms and the continuing kind of layering up of, the, of these platforms that are all modular, um, I think that the opportunities for the expansion of global value chains are huge. In other words, companies, if they know the standard uh, and they can build to the standard, can contribute uh, into global value chains that are in the new digital economy. So the sticky bits are becoming less and less sticky. Okay, so the, the, the in globalization, global value chain research, you know, what we found is that what, what, what this has meant for developing countries is that they absorb the routine work. And so they're at the bottom of the smile curve. Uh, they don't add a lot of value. Uh, they don't learn about the innovative parts and they don't learn about the kind of marketing and market connected parts. They don't have customer relationships with end users. So that is um, a kind of low value added trap. China, uh, the, the famous uh, iPhone study, that's really the impetus for the development of the kind of Tiva approach. Uh, one, of the, one of the triggers uh, was the idea that China was only adding um, you know, about $6 to the factory gate price of, a, of, a, of $300 of, of an Apple iPhone. Um, but on the export manifest, it was $300. So you're, you're overestimating your ex the value of your exports by over 2,000%. So Tiva was meant to fix that. But from a policy point of view, and it could have uh, a technological learning point of view for developing countries, um, there's you know folks are stuck in the in the bottom of the value of, the, of this uh, small curve. Um, you know the question is is that, will that continue with this new digital economy? And so this is a uh, this partial answer to that. Looking at the the big platform companies that have emerged, these are the ones that with over a billion dollars in market cap. So you can see that they're con concentrated in uh, North America, secondarily Asia, Europe's got SAP, and the others, a few small ones, um, Latin America, you know, nothing much. I think what's really um, um, important to, to even go a little deeper than that, if you look at the names, I don't know if you can see them, but the names inside the bubbles in North America, it's actually not North America, it's not just the US, it's actually, probably about 12 postal codes in Silicon Valley and Seattle. So we have a lot of inequality um, and uneven development in the United States as well, and we've seen some, um, some of the political uh, consequences of that last year. Okay, so what's gonna happen with manufacturing? Um, uh, <clears throat> you know, we've had high volume manufacturing going to China, and there's been a lot of stickiness in low volume and high mix, medium volume manufacturing in, more, in, in places closer to the market. So there's still manufacturing in Silicon Valley. In Guadalajara, uh, there's still electronics manufacturing. They used to do cell phones and laptops. That all went to China. But they got into the more high mix, higher value uh, products, and they pulled that out of the, that used to be made in the US. Um, so these are uh, kind of sticky, uh, um, where product, uh, sticky parts of the a manufacturing value chain where the product variety is higher, um, unit costs are, are, are also higher, and, and scale is lower. So with advanced manufacturing and some of these digital technologies, you can, there's two things that you can do. Um, you can actually move to mass customization in high, vo high volume manufacturing environments. So we could see faster responsiveness and um, more product variety coming out of factories in China where they, instead of churning out the same thing for six months, they might switch uh, every day or a couple times a day in terms of what they're making. Um, and we can also see scale up in these high mix environments in, at, at, in, uh, in, in you know, closer to the large markets. Um, and even in custom manufacturing or 3D printing, um, there's a lot of work with scale up there 
either using um, uh, faster throughput for 3D printing or using swarms of 3D printers that are all connected together to increase throughput through the factory. So we have a convergence around um, uh, this advanced manufacturing profile of lower costs, higher product variety, and higher scale. So it's not the same, it's not gonna all be one thing, but all of these pieces are, are kind of moving into that, uh, that quadrant right there. <clears throat> so what that leads to is, is three possibilities. So we've heard a lot about reshoring. So jobs and, min and production could mig migrate closer to where products are consumed. Um, and transportation costs could go down with along with CO2 uh, emissions. Um, inventory requirements will shrink. Customers have their needs, you know, custom needs met. It's a kind of utopian vision. Um, so we have this kind of reshoring idea. Second, that, you know, as I mentioned, you can have advanced manufacturing technologies deployed in places where manufacturing is already taking place in high volume manufacturing environments. And then you had just had this idea that everything kind of stays where it is and moves to um, this advanced manufacturing profile with the only commonality is you just don't need as much labor in any of those environments. Okay, what about innovation? So some of the tools for innovation uh, on there are platforms and all of the basic inputs to, to uh, the economy, capital, labor, um, all the parts of operations that we, we think we we talk a lot about uh, design tools, enterprise IT, et cetera, but also kind of getting things out to customers. So there's a lot of examples that I'm not going to go into to them that, that, that get into the, their, you know, just amazing how a company, you can use Kickstarter to raise money, um, you know, outsource labor from the beginning uh, through these uh, uh, you know, freelance marketplaces, um, and then use these digital tools to either you know, outsource or to, um, to make things themselves, at least at the beginning, with 3D printing, et cetera, low volume, and then get things out to customers, get the word out through these other platforms. So it's a real boon to innovation and, um, and for um, uh, is kind of spreading the wealth. And, that, and I'm sorry about the animations, but I'm trying to keep you guys awake. Um, but here's an interesting um, uh, example of AI, using AI in the design process. These are output, um, just a few samples of outputs from the Dreamcatcher um, AI suite and Autodesk. And uh, Autodesk is, a, is probably the most widely used um, electronic design software in the world. So they've added a, an add a plug into that, which is this AI suite. So what this, <coughs> which this engineer did was they just basically plugged in the requirements for the bicycle frame, you know, how, how high the handlebars and you know, the size and weight and, and maybe a lot of other things, cost, strength, you know, et cetera. And the machine generated um, hundreds or I think maybe even thousands of options for the, for the, um, for the engineer. So, uh, you know, the, the implications of that is, I mean, the way that, cause when, let's go back to the way that normally would be done. You have a team of engineers, you know, developing a bicycle frame. Then you kind of roll it out, you build it, build a prototype, you test it. You say, nah, it's not quite right. You go back and so you iterate that about five times. After about five times, you say, hey, look, we gotta, this is good enough, let's just get it out. Here we have you know, hundreds or thousands by, done by one person. And you know, the testing is all simulated, et cetera. So what are the scenarios for innovation? Um, one is that the core platforms will continue to arise in the, in the existing technology centers, um, but then that you have these opportunities for downstream platform innovation, kind of using that that um, AI suite to develop products that are appropriate for um, the customers that are in your area. So that would mean that the local, the knowledge of the local market and user characteristics would still be important, um, but you know, reduce demand for engineering, and we've been talking about skills, um, but maybe an increased demand for industrial design, artistic judgment, um, and know, knowing the market and the detailed market needs. So kind of the I, I, ability to look at that pile of bicycle frames and say, you know, that one I think is going to sell. Um, that one looks cool to me anyway. Um, I, I think maybe it could be more highly valued than it is now. And then, you know, there opens up a host of questions like if you're going to build products using these platforms, who owns the patents for those? Is it the platform owner or is it the, uh, the, the innovator? So um, just to say, you know, um, 
the idea of data, um, you know, I think we're moving past this idea of, well, adding to the, and, and I think Ellen mentioned the digital divide or the people who are disconnected from the, from the internet, um, you know, that problem was kind of understood or solved uh, more or less. But I still think there's folks that are around the world that are completely off the grid and not connected to the internet. And, but it's hard to do anything if you're not. But then there's the folks who own the data and the folks who don't. So the, the new digital divide be, could be between the data owners and the data providers. So here's a kind of, if you go back to that stack of platforms, you know, the, the core platform owners really get to see uh, all of the data on their platform. The higher level platform owners can capture their own customer data, right? The end users can sometimes see their own data and that's part of the, the product. Um, but they, but you know, and there are tools out there for, uh, for for using data to understand different things, obviously looking at Google, um, different tools. Um, but that the, the data flows really go towards those core platform owners and that's um, perhaps a serious issue. Okay, so the big unknowns are how fast this is gonna change, how it's gonna work, how it's gonna play out ge uh, geographically, how it's gonna play out in employment, and then what about development processes? Are we seeing continued frag fragmentation? Concentration, reshoring, as the speed of change of compressed development and global integration uh, move forward or move backward, will there be a backlash that will, um, you know, uh, kind of go back to kind of uh, more, um, you know, economic nationalism and other things that will push uh, back on on integration. And I think we're already starting to see some of that. Um, so, you know, industrial policies have to grapple with this idea of thin industrialization where you're just getting a part of the value chain and connected to even weaker job growth. Because that was always, if you, the thing about the being at the bottom of the smile curve, the benefit was, well, first of all, you're creating a lot of industrial taxes. So if you're really big like China, you make a lot of money, but you also create a lot of employment, right? Huge amounts of employment. So, but if you're not creating that many jobs, um, either on the innovation side or the production side, um, I'm not sure what, how, how that changes the idea of industrial policy. So given the stakes, I think that we need to measure things. And I'm probably out of time, but anyway. Um, uh, 10 more readings. Okay, perfect, all right. Um, so I've, in the paper that I put up online, there's really two approaches. Um, one is adapting our existing data resources to the NDE. And I think that um, uh, the, the presentation we heard from New Zealand was a really good example of, of that, um, either through um, uh, using input-output um, supply use tables to identify uh, data producers and data consumers, uh, the production of data, um, and you know, feeding into productivity and monetary policy, uh, or um, kind of, um, you know, and or, as a, if the other part of that is to, to work on the classifications, to try to um, both update, but also reassemble um, complementary groupings of classifications to identify clearly uh, parts of the economy that are you know, part of this digital uh, revolution. Um, things like employment and to be able to kind of pull out um, uh, chunks of the economy like, like employment or international trade that are related to the digital economy. The other piece, and we've heard about that too in this, um, the other approach, is to use the, the data that's in the digital economy itself to uh, measure the digital economy. So these data flows, um, both private data, but also private classifications. I mean, it's interesting to me, and we'll see some of this, that the, um, some of the big companies in the digital economy have had to classify activity um, and, and output and other things according to the way they, they think makes sense. Um, and that's always interesting from a statistical point of view to see how companies do it. I will say that there's a danger in that, and that you know, there's it's, it's not a it's not an apolitical process. Classification is, you know, there's this person, this company's classifications versus that company's classifications. Particularly, when you get into consulting companies, they want their classification to be different than everybody else's classification because that's their special sauce. So we struggle against this all the time. Um, I see with uh, with data um, in the data community. So anyway, uh, so how have folks tried to do this? Uh, Neil Jorgensen, I mean, um, Neil, David, David uh, sorry, David, Dale. Thank you, Dale. Dale Jorgensen at Harvard and his colleagues 
have uh, used the input output tables to um, to identify uh, IT producing industries and IT in using industries and then industries that don't use these IT at all, uh, IT intensive at all. And you know, there's just a lot in here that is, I mean, it's cool that they, they did this, but first of all, the first list is just subjective. They picked that out. These are the ones that they thought are data producing. There's a lot of data production. If you think about securities, commodity contracts, and investments, these folks are producing um, IT systems, AI. I mean, this leading AI is, is high-speed trading. So, you know, and they'll sell, sell those products to other companies. So you got you to gotta ask yourself, you know, where did that list come from? It was, it, the, the, the authors, that's, you have to do that sometimes. Had a subjective list. And then you look on the right, and you think things like agriculture, they're using, um, they're using IT more and more and more. So anyway. It was so here. Um, Van de Marl, Eric Van de Marl did the same thing using a more fine grain analysis. Uh, came up with a different list uh, in in NAICS using six digit NAICS. Uh, and so his, this is his list of kind of data producers. Again, um, I talked to Eric. You know, it's a subjective list. So, but you have a nice chart of you know that makes sense, intuitive sense on the right about uh, sectors in the economy that use data, data usage on a two-digit two level. Okay, so we, uh, I worked also with UNCTAD to try to develop, to identify um, ICT-enabled services in international trade. Um, and we, uh, so we came up with this list. Again, in the end, I mean, it was a little systematic process. That wasn't, but it was subjective because we had to look through all of the CPC categories and decide which one, similar to what New Zealand talked about yesterday, you look at the product categories. You say, "Is can this be delivered electronically or not?" All of the service, sorry, all the service categories in CPC, which are pretty detailed. You can say, "Can this be delivered uh, electronically or not?" Because if you just go with eBOPS, you know, you have this category called other business services, which has like you know 60 categories in it. Some of them are architectural services can be delivered electronically, and some like sewerage services can't. And so, you know, what, so you have to go deeper than that. And so we use the CPC list to do that. However, one caveat, you know, nobody collects international trace data and services on, on the basis of CPC. So we just have, we, we create the buckets and we have some uh, test surveys to, um, in India and Costa Rica and Thailand to test the approach, but um, it's all very kind of exploratory at this point. Uh, but using the same approach, um, sorry, you know, on the left you see AI, big data, um, crowd computing. Just my, I, I, just for fun, took the CPC list and tried to assign, you know, to, is this, could it be AI in research and development, and experimental development, uh, AI in you know, licensing and, you know, et cetera. I just kind of lined them up there. This is, this is kind of a first cut at how something like that would look. And then you have the crosswalks. To C, from CPC to, to EBOPS and to ISIC. So the important thing here, the reason that you go through these crazy exercises is to make the new complementary grouping, groupings compatible with existing classifications as opposed to just making something up brand new. And now we'll see about that. So um, in private data, uh, one of the things, that, this is a great study by Nathan and, and Russo uh, in the UK where they combined, they used the, SI, the UK SIC uh, classifications, but they went in and did a bunch of web, web scraping and, and determined which um, uh, companies, um, so they combined administrative data from the UK statistical agencies and, um, um, and they estimated that by looking at the, at the websites at what these companies are actually doing, okay, so companies that are outside the ICT industry, but were, you could tell by their website they were actually doing ICT, they determined that about 70,000 companies were missing from the UK's definition of the ICT industry. So um, the digital economy was 42% larger than they had anticipated, um, and employment was 50% 50, 50 larger. So you have this kind of, and this is a great, um, Eric Vandermeer made this diagram. It really is kind of, I think, says a million words. So yeah, the data is kind of embedded in everything. So, but, and I think what he was looking at here is um, uh, data production. But I think data is also used in all those places too. So I added in the word usage. So, the, so if you see the digital economy as the blue square, um, well, I think what we're trying to measure is how big that square is. That's one of the things we're trying to measure. I just think it's a nice kind of clear 
uh, representation of what we're looking for. But when you go to the private side, um, just looking at, this, at the web data, here's McAfee Online Services. McAfee is a big um, uh, internet security firm, and they, have, they provide other services. They be able to look through their system and look at, the, again, the types of websites that people are, are looking at. But I just thought it was really interesting to looking at the, the categories of websites that they, that they created. So these are two columns. The second column is a continuation. Um, so that's a, you know, from their point of view, how they would break up the, the websites anyway, in terms of content. <clears throat> but, you know, what we don't know is, I mean, first of all, we've already talked about access. You know, how do you get access to these databases? Do they even cover um, things that we can think of as economic data? I mean, I don't think, you know, the type of websites that people are looking at are, again, are, is economic data necessarily. And I, I think what, one thing that I haven't heard discussed is because maybe it's so obvious is that you, if you get all of the data from Airbnb, well, you don't get the data from, as I mentioned in my comments, you don't get the data from home away and you don't necessarily have a way to compare, you know, apples and oranges to the traditional um, brick and mortar hospitality industry. So, you know, the coverage questions are, are there's so much work to be done there. Um, you know, and what about reliability? Um, you know, a lot of this data is, has been sampled by the companies, and so it's not, they're using their own data science to do it, but is it transparent? How they're, what, what types of uh, algorithms they're using and are they willing to share it? And, you know, um, I just, you know, we, we just don't know if it can ever be kind of come up to the standards of, of administrative sources of data. Okay, one minute, perfect. So, what do we need to do? Um, I just think that we need to sit down and have conferences like this, but even a more concerted, long-term kind of working group task force effort to um, build these representative data sets. We do, I think we do need the private data. I think we cannot just, you know, I think that already with global value chains and globalization and all of the different trends, e-commerce, that have been worked on previously, the existing statistical system through surveys and administrative <coughs> data have really been pushed to the, to the limit uh, in terms of, 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 especially when you need to make a big jump into a, a large new topic. I'm not sure, um, and, and then you have some urgency in terms of how, what, how quickly you need the data. Um, I do think that uh, we do need the private data. Um, we need to reconcile the private uh, classifications with the, with the official classifications, develop new benchmarks um, that we can use in, in places where there are, there's much less data um, because this is a global system and that's really, really important to, and that's another stress that's been put on the statistical system and you see things like TIVA in coming up in reaction that you have a globally integrated system where values, value might be added in different places before you, you have uh, products delivered to end users. Well, this is just going to increase uh, exponentially with the digital economy, and particularly since most of the outputs are not you know, intermediate inputs that you can count. They're not widgets. It's just data flows. So you have, you know, if you're looking at data flows across the network, you know, there's really very few ways to identify what's in you know, what that represents. Um, so that's a lot of work um, that needs to be done. I think the good news is this is big, big data. So much bigger data than we usually get through surveys. Um, so I think imperfections um, are, are tolerable uh, because the, the, the sample sizes are just so incredibly huge. Thanks. Gracias, Tim. Eh, el comentador de la exposición va a ser Luis Fonserrada Pascal. Él estudió física y economía en la UNAM y obtuvo la maestría en economía en el CIDE. Posteriormente fue investigador visitante en la Universidad de Princeton y realizó sus estudios de doctorado en la Universidad Autónoma de México. En el campo académico se desempeñó como vicerrector general de la Universidad de las Américas Puebla, donde nos conocimos hace unos años, Luis, y ha sido profesor e investigador en materias económicas y financieras en instituciones tales como el CIDE, el TEC, el ITAM, la Universidad Anáhuac, la Universidad Iberoamericana, la UAM y el Colegio de México. Organizó una sociedad financiera popular, fin social, 
de la que actualmente es presidente del Consejo de Administración. Actualmente se desempeña como director del Centro de Estudios Económicos del Sector Privado. Luis, 10 minutos para tu comentario. Muy bien, gracias. Bien, muchas gracias, buenos días. Eh, gracias eh, Isidro, Julio, por la invitación para participar en esto. Eh, la verdad es fascinante. Eh, yo empezaría eh, comentando que el trabajo de Tim es, es muy completo, tiene un insight muy amplio, eh, al, al, al irlo leyendo tienes dos tipos de sensaciones primero es fascinante porque te da una visión amplísima de lo que está pasando y segundo es frightening ¿no? es impresionante lo que estamos viendo y lo que está sucediendo los invito a que lo lean con detalle porque de veras es muy interesante y además hace vínculos fascinantes con, con, con muchas variables yo tendría algunos comentarios y algunas y comentarios en forma de preguntas o preguntas en forma de comentarios. Primero tengo que protestar contra Google y contra Waze porque me trajeron 10 minutos más tarde. Pero bueno. Eh, la primera pregunta que yo diría es, eh, ¿realmente está sucediendo esto? Eh, ah, indudablemente eh, uno de mis alumnos un día llegó y me dijo oye Luis, te invitamos a una manifestación contra la globalización y dije bueno, ok pero luego hacemos otra voy, pero luego hacemos otra contra la edad media <risa> ya sucedió, ya está ahí es irremediable eh, el, 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 los procesos industriales eh, se está fraccionando el proceso de producción de una manera eh, muy acelerada y muy rápida ahora con el tratado de libre comercio y las negociaciones nos damos cuenta que estos caprichos de tratar de modificarlos es imposible porque hay un bien que sale tres veces de, esta, de México y recorre ciudades americanas, vuelve a México, otra vez vuelve y se va construyendo el producto final que a lo mejor sale a Europa después. Eh, no hay manera de modificar esto. Eh, y yo tendría, yo me concentraría, yo por suerte no me voy a dedicar a tratar de medir esto, eso se lo dejamos a Julio. Eh, pero sí voy a ser usuario, así que ojalá tengamos algunas cosas lo más pronto posible. Eh, yo me concentraría en dos temas que me parecen muy importantes que tocó Tim. Uno es la geografía de la manufactura, de la, de, de la manufactura avanzada. Y él habla... Eh, de tres posibilidades, algo que dice, bueno, a lo mejor vamos a volver a este farm to table model, ¿no? Que es, pues, como estos este, whole food que eh, toman los productos cercanos de los granjeros y te lo venden en la tiendita local. Eh, y eso, a lo mejor, tiene otras implicaciones en términos de innovación también. El otro es que los altos volúmenes y de alta escala, con escalas muy, muy amplias, eh, con mucha variedad de productos y que puedan mover muy rápidamente y definiendo precios y escasez en función de lo que sabemos con Big Data de los, de los consumidores. Esto es algo frightening que comenta claramente Tim también en su paper, ¿no? Si se pueden modificar... Eh, los precios y la producción en función de las necesidades que ya sabe que tiene la gente y con qué urgencia. También hay un lado positivo. ¿no? Eh, pero, este, ¿qué es lo que está, por ejemplo, pasando en China y que comentaba recientemente? Y el otro es que no se, en términos de la geografía, no cambien tanto los lugares de la producción, que se medio mantengan como están, eh, que no se concentren en estos lugares como en China 
y que no haya esta especie de reshoring como puede suceder. Es en términos de la manufactura. Y ese sería mi, mi primer tema. A los países en desarrollo, eh, ¿pueden influir, pueden jugar de manera significativa en este proceso? ¿O está dado por las fuerzas de los que típicamente controlan los recursos, el capital, la información y la innovación? ¿No? Y entonces, pues será que se produzcan algunas partes. Eh, ahora vemos que los blueprints se desarrollan en otros países y la producción se hace en, en la periferia. Eh, ¿Podemos modificar esto en términos de todo este reto y, y este impresionante que, que tenemos y que ya está? Y la segunda, eh, el segundo tema que a mí me parece fundamental, porque es cierto que no hay free innovation, ¿no? Yo, creo que, yo creo que es muy difícil pensar en free innovation, eh, y es la geografía de la innovación. Y aquí tenemos algunos temas que son de veras eh, fundamentales. ¿El costo laboral ya no tiene importancia? ¿Ya es irrelevante? Eh, y es una de las preguntas que plantea Tim. De veras, en este proceso de industrialización, en este proceso de manufactura avanzada y de, y de eh, esta economía digital, eh, ¿ya el costo para el futuro de la mano de obra es irrelevante? Eh, y en ese sentido, eh, ¿qué puede pasar con la geografía de la innovación? De nuevo, un reshoring... El presidente Obama tenía un, un programa de política industrial en la Casa Blanca. Yo platiqué con algunos de los que trabajaban en esto y la verdad es que todavía se estaba pensando en una política industrial que yo creo que era más del siglo XX que de ahora, pero el reshoring estaba ahí ya desde entonces. Luego, un tema fundamental en esto de la innovación y, del, y, de, y, de, y de la geografía, me parece que es, Tim no lo mencionó en su, puso la gráfica, pero no lo mencionó en su exposición, que es el, el, la, la, el smile curve, ¿no? la curva eh, eh, pues de risa. Y quise decir, y quiero decir risa, porque entonces traté de traducir smirk, y, no, y no, no smile, ¿no? El smile es una, es una curva más profunda que pone en, en desventaja a los países que no se ajusten, que no tomen el desarrollo. Pero un smirk, que a lo mejor podemos llamar sonrisa, ¿no? Sí requeriría una eh, mucho más eh, activa participación de estos países en términos de innovación. Pasar de hecho en México, por ejemplo, a creado en México, a diseñado en México y en cualquier otro país en desarrollo. La tercera opción del, del tema de la innovación eh, eh, y la geografía de la innovación es que se siga dando como más o menos se va dando, en algunos lugares sí, en otros lugares no, y que se mantenga esta tendencia. Eh, y yo creo que el gran reto, y ese es, y con esto termino, es el empleo, indudablemente. En México tenemos eh, no, no un desempleo de 1.8 millones, eso es solo la tasa de desempleo, pero esto no toma en cuenta los subempleados, ni a los disponibles para trabajar. El concepto importante, me parece, como en Estados Unidos, por ejemplo, es el que se conoce como U6, que es el que cubre a, todos estos, eh, eh, a todas estas personas en búsqueda de empleo eh, o de subempleo, y tenemos 11 millones y medio en ese caso. Es el 10% de la población y es el 17, 19% de la población de la fuerza de trabajo eh, potencial. Eh, esto es, y además tenemos 80 o 100 mil jóvenes incorporándose a la fuerza de trabajo cada mes, un millón al año. Eh, 
Este es el reto, adicional a los que nos regale la economía eh, digital. Entonces, creo, me parece, y yo quisiera conocer la opinión de Tim y de todos, me parece que lo que tenemos que hacer es entrar más seriamente a la innovación también y ver qué tipo de políticas efectivamente tenemos que llevar a cabo para, para resolver este reto importantísimo del empleo. Gracias. Gracias Luis. Estamos apenas atrasados gracias a Google y a Wise, pero tenemos tiempo para preguntas que queremos hacer. Eh... ¿Sí? Allá hay una. Juntamos, uh, we, we have, we join some questions together and then you answer. Yeah, sure. Okay, sure. Well, my question is regarding the figure you show us about the geography of the, uh, of the digital companies. Uh, it's very interesting, but also it's frightening to use the word. Because uh, I haven't heard um, discussing about the high concentration of these, of these companies. And so my question is, what are the implications for this high concentration? Because from uh, on one side, what are the implications for, for productivity, but also for regulation? Because on one side, we were discussing yesterday about the, the, mis, the possible mismeasurement of productivity. But uh, uh, Paul argued that we should be measuring somewhere uh, this productivity. But if that were the case, then the Paradise Papers wouldn't be a surprise, right? So maybe these companies, these few companies are uh, extracting the, most of the benefits of the productivity and that they are not being redistributed to, to the population. And if we look at the, at the wages, uh, they are being stagnant. If we look at the mobility rate, and if, for example, in America or in Mexico, uh, people, ha uh, they are also have been stagnant. So, so probably, um, these few companies are getting, extracting most of the productivity profits. And, and then the question goes uh, for regulation, what are the implications? Do we want to redistribute these, these, these benefits uh, for the population? The, this uh, discussion of the universal income is very romantic, but, but how do we get to work it? For, uh, on one hand, why should these companies uh, redistribute these profits of the of the productivity they are getting, and but on the other side, the, on the other side, they have uh, the social responsibility, right? So, so I would like to hear your your comment. <coughs> okay. Alguna otra pregunta? Eh, yo tengo una. Eh, in this uh, high volume, high mix, and custom that you you mentioned in one of your graphics, yeah. eh, is there any possibility of leapfrogging there for developing countries, I would say. No more questions? Donde? Ah, uh, Paul, sorry, I haven't seen you. Um, Tim, in your, in your final slide, you mentioned uh, the need to uh, use private uh, data sets and sort of uh, uh, for, for uh, statistical purposes. You mentioned the uh, issues associated with accessing those data sets. Uh, I, I was wondering if uh, there were any business models that would uh, generate incentives for uh, private data holders to share them for uh, public purposes. And uh, I think there are also issues for statistical offices to think what they could offer to the private data generation gen generators in terms of know-how uh, for dealing with data. I mean, to, to give you two examples, one is statistic offices have a decade-long experience in dealing with confidentiality. That's something that you know private firms not necessarily have, but they need. Uh, the other thing is that to make private data representative, you often need sort of weights for you know from registers or for the overall population that you want to combine with these sources. So I, I, I'm just wondering whether you have come across sort of uh, promising business models that would would uh, operate along those those ways and really benefit both both uh, the public and the private players. Uh, Marshall. Uh, thinking about implications of all the changes and um, 
I recollected a paper on uh, cloud computing. And one of the uh, measurement problems that was unanticipated was uh, underestimation of a certain kind of investment. Uh, you're probably familiar with the paper, but basically the, uh, the, these large internet uh, platforms that uh, offer cloud computing services like Microsoft manufacture their own servers. Mm -hmm. And national accounts is set up to measure investment in servers because they're shipped from the server manufacturing industry to the ultimate user. So now we may have a case where end users can create more and more of their fixed assets. So I wonder, is that a possible outcome, a likely outcome? And uh, it does seem like it would create more measurement challenges for people trying to measure investment correctly. Uh, y otra pregunta ya? Y, y we finish this first round. Hi. Um, I wanted to talk about the data ownership because uh, right now the enterprises, the firms, do not have really incentives to give out their data. So, like uh, yesterday, the, the person from the European Union said, it is difficult to convince them to give out their data, and I think it's going to remain like that. But uh, right now, um, the, the regulations actually give them their data. Someone uses a platform, and the data is recorded, so the regulations right now say, Okay, the data that was generated belongs to the one that uh, stored them, that uh, has the, the computer where the data is in. So my question is, um, is it desirable, is it possible to change this idea of data ownership and give uh, ownership back to the user and not to the one that stores the the transaction, because actually that would give uh, governments the chance to have access to this data without uh, fighting for, for it with the big companies that have a lot of uh, leverage uh, by now. So that's a question. Okay, so you have three minutes. <laughs> okay. or less. Let's make it four. <laughs> okay, so um, I, I, in three minutes I can't, please. Uh, oh, sorry, thank you. Uh, in three minutes, I can't address all of that, but I, I, I just want to um, address the first question that Luis asked, which is, is this happening? So I, I just want to send a warning that, you know, we've lived through various waves of, you know, disruptions and things are happening. And w one I remember, because I worked on it pretty intensively, was services offshoring. So there was a panic phase in the U.S. anyway, I don't think as much in Europe, that all of the office buildings, so we lost all manufacturing and now the office buildings would be sucked clean, right, because everything's going to India. And in fact, you know, that didn't happen in that when all of the, the careful work that was done, um, it was pretty small um, and that we had a lot of outsourcing of services, but a lot of that was domestic uh, for a variety of, of reasons. Um, but there's a, um, and we see this happening now with digital there was studies done just looking at occupational characteristics and saying this is offshoreable, this is offshoreable. And so the headline is, you know, 80% of jobs are offshoreable. And we're seeing that now with the digital economy that in AI is that some huge amount of knowledge work is basically can be automated. And, and so the, the, what I've seen is that the, the general public just takes us in immediately as done. <laughs> so, so it's a, and then it has real effects. So I, I think the rhetoric is, is, is overblown. And, and, and um, people don't ask for raises. They are fair, afraid. Um, they're maybe not afraid for their job because they see the rea reality of it, but they're afraid for some invisible other person's job, and they might vote differently because there's a sense of, of fear and foreboding. And I, I think we're really seeing that um, happen again here. So we need to be careful. It also um, it happens because there's a lack of data. I mean, when you have data, then you just come back with facts and say, no, this is what's really going on. Without any data, people can say whatever they want, and they are. So I just, I want to start out with that. I don't think nothing's happening, um, but we just don't know, and we have to be careful um, how we talk. I think a lot of, some of the other questions were really about employment. Now, 
uh, we had a really interesting exchange yesterday about the idea that if, if the adoption of these technologies is more gradual in developing countries, maybe these are um, uh, societies where rules can be put into place um, kind of in, in, a, in, a, um, in a proactive way as opposed to kind of trying to close the barn door you know, this metaphor, after the heart, the horse has already left, which we already, that's how we feel in the U.S. It's like, well, Uber's here, you know, <laughs> uh, so we're, we're done. So, so I, I think that one thing that we have to, again, taking a historical um, uh, frame, uh, the, these, if you look at it as, as waves of, of industrial revolutions, if you take this kind of fourth industrial revolution idea, you know, in prior um, technological revolutions, the technologists have gotten really excited, and they are. This is right now, the technologists are really, really excited about all this. Uh, see the potential, see the, uh, the, the potential for productivity increase. Um, and when you, but when you have sudden productivity increases, a lot of people are thrown out of work. You also have, dis, you're talking about real organizations that, you know, may absorb this technology very unevenly. Um, and, and ineffectively and have negative consequences. So with IT revolution, this is, I guess that was the third or the second and 0.2.5, whatever revolution, um, you know, there was a, this, re, the, the idea in the U.S. was re-engineering the organization. So we take the IT system, we rationalize everything, and, 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 and connected to re-engineering re was downsizing. So there was a lot of people thrown out of work, there was a lot of disruption. I think the other thing with, outs with this rampant outsourcing uh, that came with that, that technological wave because of the modularity that I talked about. That's often IT, IT driven. The IT allows you to outsource, right? So, but companies lost a lot of important knowledge when they did that. They, this idea of core competency, you know, these are kind of ideological, essentially, waves of kind of, this is best practice, this is how you do it, and the financial community gets behind it and says, if you don't have a China strategy or if you don't outsource, we're not going to, you know, like, what are you doing, you know? And so, and for a startup, if you come and say, well, we're going to have a factory, that's part of our business model. They're like, what? You know, no, you have your factory in China, you have your idea here in Silicon Valley. So, um, so those, those ideologies are really important, and it often is, is followed by a second wave. So the technological waves comes in two, two parts. The first part is the uh, quick adoption and excitement and negative consequences. And then there's a kind of rationalization to put these systems on a more humane footing and a more, uh, frankly, a more um, effective uh, business footing, a uh, commercial footing. And so you, so, so you move from things like, you know, re-engineering to knowledge management, where, okay, now we need to manage our knowledge as opposed to just kind of willy-nilly throwing it around. So, so I think that we right now are in the first phase of, of this with the digital economy of being very excited about implementing these things very quickly. There's a lot of disruption, and I think we're already seeing the seeds of pushback, of regulation, of, uh, and this is, you know, your question about, about, uh, uh, about regulation, I think, is important. So then, very, just very, very quickly, I know we're, we're out of time, um, you know, the, for the, the question about, um, you know, these investments or what's shipped where, I mean, that's just exactly the problem of it. You're, you, I'm not a, a national accounts person, so you, that's your problem to work out. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, but the, the, the question about ownership data, um, uh, uh, Jared Lanier wrote, uh, wrote a, has a, has a um, he's a kind of technology guru, kind of think person in Silicon Valley who has a critical view of a lot of this. And his idea is that you really need to pay the data users. And it's more than just kind of give them access to the data or control over it, but you actually need to pay them for all the free data that they're pumping into the system. And his, that's actually his um, uh, solution for the fact that people are supposedly, and I say this, you know, I'm not saying that's true, but that people don't have work. So, you, so this idea of the guaranteed income well, it's not just a guaranteed income, but you're actually paid for your contribution to the internet. So if you're there kind of blogging and commenting and reviewing, you know, you're spending a lot of time. You know, maybe, you know, you're adding value to a lot of people's platforms. Maybe you should get paid for that. So for all the people whose questions I didn't answer, um, I'm sorry, but you should stop there. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Tenemos algunas costumbres de la Edad Media, le vamos a dar un micrófono acá. Ah. Thank you very much. Wow. Eh, present, also. De la Edad Media. Gracias. Sí. Is it for you, please? Ah, gracias. Ah, thank you. Thank you very much. Si, ya, es ready. What if I had done a terrible job? <laughs>